you know, you all know Google. We started as a small company with a big idea. And back then, if you wanted to do something that involved a lot of data, you basically had no choice then to become an infrastructure company. So even though we were a search company, we wanted to be a search company, we had to be an infrastructure, infrastructure company because there was no cloud. There was actually no scalability, really, with very few exceptions. And at that time, actually many companies really struggled with that. And the number of companies failed because they couldn't really solve their infrastructure uh, problems. So this is a big part of my uh, early life um, at Google, uh, some of which is uh, uh, now uh, on display in, in the Computer uh, History Museum a few miles down the road. Uh, some of the things I'm proud of and some of the things I'm less proud of. Uh, uh, take this example. This was our first uh, Google-designed uh, server rack. Um, you know, not proud of, of, of what it is and how it looks like. It has some, uh, some, some deficiencies. Um, but we um, designed and implemented it and had 2,000 of them in a matter of about six to seven weeks. And so given that constraint, it was actually, it was actually an okay um, solution. It was certainly a, a cost-effective uh, solution. So with that comes really the, the blood, sweat, and tears uh, of, of sort of infrastructure. And, and in the early days of, of Google, it was really um, you know, some blood, uh, certainly a lot of sweat, certainly a lot of tears. Um, uh, and I joked that our data centers were so hot that, you know, before your tear hit the ground, it was it already evaporated. Um, so, so um, it was really that time. Um, I decided not to come with a lot of uh, ancient pictures because I want to uh, uh, show the future. But um, um, those were the early days, and really everyone was doing their own thing because they had to. Now, fast forward sort of the last uh, 10 years or so, we've actually been very public. Sometimes we have a history or, or a, a reputation for being secretive, but actually we've been very public about what we're doing in our infrastructure really for a uh, span of, of over a decade. Here you see some uh, milestones in uh, uh, Google infrastructure that we have talked about publicly, usually in in an academic, uh, in a scientific uh, conference, uh, sometimes in another form. So way back when, in, in 2002, we published a paper about GFS, the Google file system, was a cluster file system that made a, a sea of unreliable disk drives into a, a reliable uh, uh, file system. Uh, MapReduce, right, which you all uh, know today, uh, uh, spawned off uh, Hadoop. Big table uh, in the Hadoop world, that's HBase uh, in 2008. Uh, Dremel, it now externally available as BigQuery, is a, a NoSQL, uh, sorry, a SQL, ad hoc SQL queries over, over very, very large data sets. Um, Colossus, which is a, a successor to GFS, so an even better file system, basically. Uh, Spanner, which is a successor to Bigtable, uh, basically more scalable, much more consistent. Uh, and then on the top line, you see our external uh, uh, products there. So really, we spent you know, billions of dollars uh, on, on building the best infrastructure in the world because we needed it for our own uh, applications. Um, and that's why you might say that Google as a, as a company is really a great infrastructure with a great UI. Because when you use our products, you don't really see the infrastructure behind it, you just see the products. But the infrastructure behind it is why Gmail, for example, uh, had 100 times more storage than other storage, uh, than other email solutions when it came out in 2004, or why our search index indexes more web pages than, than pretty much any uh, other uh, search, in, uh, search engine, and actually pretty much any other indexing system sort of out there uh, in the world. Now, a few years ago, uh, starting with App Engine about seven years ago, uh, and then seriously with, with uh, the Google Cloud platform, we started to externalize this infrastructure to the rest of the world. Uh, because very clearly, the rest of the world, I think IT in general, is still um, struggling with a whole lot of things. And we're struggling with them too, but we figured it doesn't really make sense to independently struggle, struggle rather than to actually 
offer the, some of the things that we solved already really in an external product for the benefit of others. And then in a public cloud, have this sort of bootstrapping effect and this network effect where a great infrastructure enables better solutions, which then in turn enables even better solutions, and then whole applications, uh, and so on, and so on. Now, what do I mean by, by all of this? Uh, cloud Platform is um, um, our external uh, product, has uh, tons of components, kind of the things that you would expect, you know, VMs, block storage, blob storage, you know, SQL, packaged apps, um, um, you know, networks, sort of, you know, the usual kind of thing. But I'm gonna tell you about a few things really on how we're thinking about the cloud and where we're gonna go with that that aren't either in, 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 in that aren't really in today's market. And so to, uh, to, to look a little bit deeper into that, let me kinda um, tell you about the differences between what our external product is and what our internal uh, uh, product is. Um, they're both built on the same foundation. So same hardware, well, same data centers, same server infrastructure, same hardware infrastructure, same low level everything, right? So all of the control plane and the data plane, so to speak, is really shared. Where it starts to differentiate is that on the, in the external world wants VMs, and so we have VMs sitting on top of that. In our internal worlds, we don't, we don't really use VMs, we use containers. We have used containers since, you know, I don't know, 2000 and I'm guessing three or four. Uh, in fact, we made them work in the Linux kernel uh, because they didn't used to work and, and, and it really helped sort of evolve the kernel side of things because we wanted isolation between different tasks. So based on really how the external world having a different demand, there is a bifurcation um, where the product externally looks different, has different features, than internally, but the substrate on which it's placed on is really the same. And I'll walk you a few, a few, uh, a few examples and kind of show um, 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 how this all works. But before I get there, um, I want to talk about one thing that was a big portion of, of motivating us to really come uh, out with an external product. What we observed was that the curves that um, for sort of publicly consumable compute or storage cycles did not follow Moore's law, right? We have a good understanding, obviously, of hardware costs because we're a large hardware consumer or uh, you might say hardware manufacturer. And, you know, Moore's law by and large is still in effect, right? The average cost per gigabyte, let's say, in the last 10 years has come down by something like, you know, I don't have the number right in my head, but I'm guessing 35, 40% annually. Right? over 10 years, compound, right? So huge, huge, huge reduction. But if you look at the cost of the actual, you know, the OPEX of a, of a gigabyte uh, uh, per month or per year, it historically really hasn't followed that curve. It hasn't followed that curve sort of in IT vendor space, and it also hasn't followed that curve in public cloud space. And so one of the things that we really committed to publicly uh, last year and also then showed with, with uh, fairly dramatic uh, price cuts of about 35% relative to the then uh, market uh, in, 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 I think it was March last year, was that you know, we are going to follow Moore's law to the extent that we can, meaning that if our costs go down, then our prices will go down. Because we think at the lowest level of just buying infrastructure, you know, here's a disk block, here's a CPU cycle, here's a, you know, a gigabyte of RAM, there should really be a strong correlation between those two curves. The two curves are not identical, right? Like you can't expect your dollar per gigabyte OPEX, right? Dollar per gigabyte per month to follow the hardware cost because there is non-depreciation OPEX in it, right? You have power, you have repairs, you have other kind of things. But by and large, there should be an exponential decay and it should be pretty noticeable and it should be correlated with what the external market sells, disk drives at.